So we begin our worship today by naming our current reality together, that our society feels broken. We can't seem to find common ground. And tragically, our differences are preventing us from addressing major problems that affect all of us, Respond, responding to COVID-19, remediating climate change, addressing fundamental issues of human rights, and shoring up democracy. So let us enter into this time of worship with open hearts and minds, holding the reality in which we live. May the time we spend together and the community we foster help us remember again our values. May it increase our compassion that we might respect all people, even those with whom we disagree mightily. May it amplify our hope that we might not give up on our ideals. And may it remind us of our higher calling to love our neighbors and to work with them to leave the world better than we found it. Our gathering music for today is The Great Divide by Luke Combs and Billy Strings. Good morning. My name is Karma Amos and I am honored to serve as the minister of the Unitarian Universalists of Central Delaware and to welcome you to worship this morning. We are so glad that you're here. We hope that you will find ample room in this community for your spirit. We are grateful today for the opportunity to welcome a special guest, a friend and mentor of mine, Dr. Greg, Greg Carey. Uh, Dr. Carey is the professor of New Testament at Lancaster Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania, where he's taught since 1999. He holds a BA from Rhodes College and MDiv from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and a PhD from Vanderbilt University. Greg's research interests include the Book of Revelation and ancient apocalyptic literature, the Gospel of Luke, and public biblical interpretation. He is the author or co-editor of nine books and is currently working on a 10th on biblical eschatology. You could have seen Dr. Carey on the BBC, PBS, the Discovery Channel, or the History Channel, and he is a frequent contributor to Christian Century and the Huffington Post. He fields media interviews regarding biblical studies and the interface of contemporary Christianity and politics. An Alabama native, Greg is an active layperson in the United Church of Christ, where he has served in national and international ecumenical settings. Greg was also my favorite New Testament professor, and he's an all around great guy. So please welcome him warmly today. We continue to be grateful for the technology that allows us to worship together online and to continue building community in other ways. Um, we thank you in advance for your patience and grace with any delays or glitches we might experience due to technology. In addition to our worship each Sunday at 10, we meet on Tuesday evenings at seven for a more informal time of checking in and sharing. Please consider joining us for that gathering. And by way of announcements today, I want to let you know that immediately following worship or actually immediately following our sh a short uh, virtual coffee hour, uh, Dr. Carey will be giving us a bonus workshop. This will be an informal time of Q&A in which he'll share some of the research that informs today's sermon. And we'll discuss some of our own experiences in trying to bridge the divides in our society. Next. Sunday is the beginning of our church year in which we typically celebrate water communion, which we will be doing in a slightly different way. So we're, we'll be having a libation ritual and encourage you to bring with you um, on Zoom some water that may have some uh, special significance to you and a plant or an empty container in which to pour it. And lastly, by way of announcements, uh, as we prepare for Delaware Pride, which is being held on October 2nd in Dover, our Pride team is helping to coordinate the efforts for all of the Delmarva UU congregations. The leader of our team is Alex LeClaire, and we're meeting currently on Thursday evenings for our planning. If you're interested in assisting with that or taking part or volunteering, please let us know. And now as we prepare ourselves for worship, I invite you to take a deep breath as we reaffirm our intentions to be a radically welcoming community. Whoever you are, whomever you love, 
wherever you've been, whatever you've done, whatever your religious beliefs are or aren't, you are welcome in this spiritual community. However you move in this world, how much or how little is in your bank account or your wallet, and however you are feeling in these moments we share, you and all of who you are are welcome in this spiritual community. We're all enhanced by being together. The words for our chalice lighting this morning come from Cindy Fezgen. We are all capable in different ways with various strengths and talents. We are all holy, part of the universe and the inter interdependent web. We light this chalice cherishing our differences and holding each other in sacredness. Please join me in unison for the affirmation. Words are in the chat box. And here it is. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. To love one another. Please sing along in your own environment with our opening song, People Get Ready. This version by the Impressions, as it was recorded in 1965, the words will appear on your screen. People get ready, there's a train a coming. You don't need no baggage, you just get on board. All you need is faith to hear the diesels humming. You don't need no ticket. You just thank the Lord. So people get ready. There's a train to Jordan. Picking up passengers from coast to coast. Faith is the key. Open up the doors and board them. There's hope for all among those who love the most. Oh, there ain't no room for the hopeless sinner who would hurt all mankind just to say. Just thank the
Each week at UUCD, we include a brief UU moment in our worship service that serves to make us aware of and to nurture our connection to the larger body of Unitarian Universalists and the Unitarian Uni Universalist Association that binds us together. And for our UU moment today, we want to highlight the long history that Unitarian Universalists have of being political, but not partisan. Public witness on justice issues is a long-standing spiritual practice of UUs. Well, since well before the UUA was formed, we believe that social justice is part of our spiritual calling. We know that engaging fully with the contentious and difficult topic, uh, topics of our day is necessary if we want to make a positive difference in the world, and we do. It's hard to do that sometimes in the United States. There is a widespread misbelief that religious bodies, congregations cannot be involved with political issues. But the UUA provides us clear guidance in accordance with US law that this is not the case. We are completely free as individuals and as a congregation to publicly advocate for any issue voting rights, civil rights, living wages, gender equity, climate change, LGBTQ rights, migrant justice, reproductive justice, indigenous justice, racial justice, refugee support, and so much more. We just can't endorse a party or a candidate. But when we stick to the issues that matter and not any party or person who agrees or disagrees with us, we are able and empowered to put our faith in action and our beliefs into practice. UU congregations everywhere and the UUA that holds us together are continuing to live out our principles and compassionately care for our world. And we are proud that UUCD is a part of that movement. If you want to participate in our work more directly, please consider joining our Social and Environmental Justice Committee. It's that time. It's always a big time. You're the family. We're your family. We're all family. Joys and concerns. What's your joy? What's your concern? What have you been? Where have you gone? What are you doing? What's going on? How are things within your life? These are all important to us. If we don't have them together, our family unit suffers. We don't get to know what's going on with you. Talk to us, share with us, light a candle with us. Share with us everything that you're thinking. Be part of it. Let yourselves know that you are one and all, and we're together. Put yourself on gallery view so you can see who wants to share. Let yourself mute and unmute when you need to so that you keep yourself always connected. We want to hear from you. We want to know what's going on with you. And it's all because of love always love, forever love. I reach for another candle for those who don't share. It's okay. We get it. We know what it's like. We've been there. We've done that. This is for you. This is for all the lights across the United States, across the globe, all the candles in every church, every temple, lighting to remember each other. That's what this is about. The chalice lighting is going on everywhere. Even their joys and their concerns, they're being touched by all of us as we touch all of them. This is for them. This is for you. This is for all of us. 
As Unitarian Universalists, the central part of our worship in person online is the opportunity we all have to practice the art of generosity and the spiritual practice of gratitude. Our gifts to our congregation are what allow our communities to live into our calling and mission. We are grateful to you for the many ways you support our community, including your financial pledges and offerings. Your gifts matter, and it's one of the ways that you make this world a better place. All right, Phil. Let them know why it's important to be a UU member. I'm Phil Troxler and am a founding member, so I pledge to UUCD because it is important to me. We are a community that cares about each other. There have been many times I received help, advice, and problem assistance from members, whether it was rides to medical appointments or free equipment such as a treadmill. Spiritually, I found our in-person service peaceful and hope that we can return to them in the future. I look forward to when we can gather as a community again. And I'm Honey the Treasurer, and to me, my, the reason I pledge to UUCD is the importance of community in which we can all worship in our own ways that we're able to agree to disagree and support each other even when we don't necessarily agree with a particular point of theology. Thank you for your passion and your generosity. For those who are making pledges or who want to contribute to UUCD, please visit www.uucd.org and click on support UUCD for more information about how to either donate online or to send in a check. Our offertory for today is we are all we all bleed the same by Melissa. If I could talk straight, I'd be doing well. Man, Mandalissa with Toby Mack and Kirk Franklin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Don Mears, and I'm a member of UUCD. Today, I'll be reading two passages. The first is from the New Testament of the Christian Bible, and the second is an excerpt from the book, Democracy in Black, Our Race Still Enslaves the American Soul by Professor Eddie Glaub, Jr. And this is the first one. It's from a reading from the Apostle Paul. This is the book of Galatians, verse five, chapter five, verse 22. And 23. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. There is no law against such things. And this is from Professor Glaub. People who shut their eyes to reality, simply invite their own destruction, and anyone who insists on remaining in a state of innocence long after that innocence is dead, turns themselves into a monster. Are we a nation of monsters? Morning, everyone. Um, so I wish I were in person, but I'm so happy to be here with all of you today. Uh, really, I'm happy because I was in a wiffle ball game last night with people who had had different amounts to drink and there were multiple collisions and I'm happy to be here. Um, but I'm also extremely honored and pleased to be invited by Karma, who is one of our 
alums, the only one who your students always teach you. Uh, Karma is the only one who formally taught me. Um, she took a class with me where she knew more from the start than I did. So there we are. Um, it is a pleasure to see all of you. And as we've acknowledged at the opening of worship and in the music that was so beautifully selected, there's a lot of despair about the brokenness of our society. Faced with this pandemic, we can't come to a common mind and protect each other with fast uh, masks and vaccines, wildfires, heat waves, floods, droughts, hurricanes, and we can't seem to find common solutions to mitigate climate change. About a third of the population thinks the last presidential election was stolen, and it's not really clear uh, that our neighbors support democracy. And we could go on but we're divided. And beyond being divided as a society, we're alienated from one another, families, friends who avoid each other. And where the ties remain, there's this tiptoeing, right? Around sensitive subjects with people we love. It's not the first time. Um, this country has been through it, probably worse. But the thing that feels really unnerving right now is that so much of our differences are fueled by disinformation. In other words, there's always a certain kind of nuttiness, a measure of irrationality, but disinformation, sophisticated, technological, broadcast on major media and in the remote corners of the internet. This information invented by super smart people, people who know better than to do what they're doing, people who are getting paid millions or hundreds of thousands of dollars, stirring up with this wicked disinformation, folks' resentments, making people scared, angry all the time, feeling like those who disagree with them are enemies. And what the way we see this disinformation being as serious a threat as it is, isn't that people's perceptions are changing and just that we're divided, but I bet you're feeling it, that extremism tends to feed on itself, right? So people buy into little things and then medium things and then bigger and bigger things. And it leaves the rest of us watching and thinking, we just can't imagine how this happens. Disinformation turns people into a tribe where loyalty to the tribe is everything. Group this big, probably most of you have experienced this with someone you love. Uh, just recently, I visited a friend whose kids won't visit their father because they can't tolerate him anymore. So it's in this context that Karma invited me to speak about how we can understand and relate to people who see the world very, very differently than we do. I'm thinking particularly of white evangelicals in, in our context. And I wanna be clear that you will have insights I don't have, that's why we get to talk later, um, that you may know better about some of the things I'm about to say than I do. Uh, the background I have to talk about this is some training in the study of religion, how it works. Uh, from my experience as a person who has been a Southern Baptist and still uh, walks with Jesus and talks with Jesus like evangelicals do. Um, and who reads some in the social sciences, particularly psychology and social psychology. So, I mean, these are just things I'd like to share that I often find helpful. And I'll be honest, direct, and simple. In fact, there are only three things I really want to say, but I'm a professor, so it takes a while. Um, but just three things. And then we have the opportunity to chat after the surface. So thing one, let's talk about how all of us, how all of us change our minds. 
And I invite you, I know on Zoom, it's a bad thing to do, but I invite you to take just a moment and reflect about a time when you've changed your mind about something that was important and see if you can think to yourself, I'm not gonna ask for sharing, but how'd that happen? I started changing my mind about LGBTQ folk about 30 years ago. I was a student at, I was introduced, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And you might imagine, I assumed that I knew what God's will for sexuality was, and it was pretty specific and pretty narrow. It's what I'd been taught. It's what I believed. It's what pretty much everybody I knew thought. Why well, change my mind? And it's important to say I hadn't thought about it much. It wasn't important to me. It wasn't on my radar. I wasn't in any kind of relationship that I knew about with someone who was out. And the research shows that back in the early 90s, most straight people were not aware that they were in close relationship with someone who was not straight. That's changed. Um, but it was typical back then. We didn't talk about it in church. It wasn't a point of emphasis. I didn't know much. One of my seminary professors suggested, I mean, suggested that maybe the churches had it wrong about sexuality. And I noticed, eh, I didn't let it sink in. One of my friends was taking a course where they were reading a new book on theology and sexuality. And it too suggested the church needed to take another look. And again, I noticed, whatever. And a third friend, a close friend from college who also went to the same seminary, um, we were out playing golf together, uh, which gives you time to talk. And he shared that he changed his mind on the issue. That's three. And it had my attention a little bit, but I wasn't actively working on the question. And one day, a young woman who had just graduated from high school, I was her youth pastor in a country Baptist church in Indiana, made an appointment with me. 18-year-olds don't make appointments. And came out. My attention was on 100% now, right? And somehow I knew that she wasn't misguided. I knew her well. I had watched her try to date boys, not pretty. And I knew in that context, the hostility she would receive if she came out in that moment. And I knew without any question, I knew one thing that my job was to protect her and bless her. That's all I needed. I hadn't quite changed my mind yet, but now I was well on the way. And what I wanna say is that's typical of how we change our minds. Psychologists will confirm it that we may think we've worked through an issue intellectually, but usually we've worked through it at some other level in our lives before we do the thinking stuff. And then we figure out what that means and we call it changing our minds. The real process happens somewhere else below that level of intellectual consciousness through relationships and through experiences, often little by little. New ideas make more sense when other things in our lives prepare us for them. And I'm sure we've changed our minds sometimes in ways that are more intellectual, but when we think about people we care about, people we're convinced are wildly wrong about important things, it's important to remember how did they get there and how they might change. 
Because there is, yes, there's a cognitive dimension, but change is happening at other levels that are actually more profound in terms of how people work. And that has relation, uh, implications for how we're going to relate to them. For example, there's almost no point in arguing. I've given presentations to Protestant churches on LGBTQ inclusion. I mean, I've talked to thousands of people um, all over the United States and in different parts of the world, and twice someone has come up to me and told me I changed their mind. There's no point in having those kinds of debates. I'm not saying there's no point in offering information. That's why I do those workshops. But information alone is rarely the answer. If people we care about are wrong about things that are really important, the most important thing we can do, if we can, talk about that in a minute, if we can, the most important thing we can do is stay in relationship with them because actually they work the same way we do. That's thing one, how people really, really, really change their minds. Thing two is about religion and the role of religion in where people are with other kinds, what seem to be other kinds of opinions. Religion is experiential, especially for evangelicals. For all people, religion is mystical in part, and it is social. That's what I mean by experiential, mystical and social. I'm gonna talk in a particular way about what that means to evangelicals. Because for evangelicals, especially white evangelicals, you and I might interpret their spiritual experiences differently than they do. You know what? It doesn't matter. How, I mean, it really doesn't matter how we interpret their experiences. If we wanna connect with someone, we have to use our imaginations and accept the terms in which they understand themselves. Even when it's hard for us to believe. See, being an evangelical, the primary thing about being an evangelical is defined by mystical experience. When, when evangelicals sing that they walk with Jesus and talk with Jesus, they're singing an experience that they feel. They talk about all the time, asking Jesus into their heart. They pray for Jesus to fill their heart. If they're Pentecostal or charismatic, they pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit. More than anything else, evangelicals want to know Jesus. And we can explain that to a degree through psychology or sociology or cultural anthropology. And I'm in favor and teach all those ways of thinking about religious experience but it won't help us understand what's at stake for someone we care about. In college, I had a theology professor, remember, a little Southern Baptist taking a critical theology course in college who just scared the socks off me. And I kept working with him. I went to his office multiple times. Uh, he was raising questions about Christianity that I'd never uh, entertained. And it's scary when that happens to your faith. Um, when it happens to the way you define yourself is made open to question. And Professor Michael McLean understood something very basic about that. And in his office, he said, Greg, is there anything you could learn that would make you question your relationship with God? I knew the answer immediately. I Nothing was going to make me deny my religious experience. It didn't matter what I learned. It didn't matter what I changed my mind about. I didn't need to be scared. And whether or not this makes sense to you, that's still true for me. Now, there are many evangelicals who are trying to fake it till they make it, that wish they had that mystical experience they talk about in their churches all the time. Uh, you might remember that uh, Mother Teresa wrote about wishing she had the spiritual experiences that Roman Catholic Christians longed for. She wanted to feel close to Jesus, and she didn't. But they want it. They value it. Their community talks about it and values it. 
And so they hang in there. And when you take how important that experience is to them, blend it with the reality that it is social. Evangelicals spend more time together than you and I spend time together, right? Uh, we may look at some of their mega churches and think, oh, they're going for the light show and it's shallow and they just go to be entertained and then they leave. But the way those churches work is they also have a chance to be on the hospitality team or the food drive team. Uh, the churches try to get them into a small group that meets weekly. They could be in a volleyball league. They might be in some church-related activity four or five times a week. And that group is where they continue to have their values reinforced and their identity affirmed. So when you think about it that way, when you have spiritual experiences and spiritual values, and they cannot be separated from the social setting that gives you a sense of belonging and affirmation, you following me? Changing your mind about a defining issue puts you in a very awkward place. You're stepping into a strange territory. Um, that's going to strain the relationships that give you security. Even, you know, love is conditional in that way. So we might think about ourselves, where we live, and our social circles. You know, the truth be told, I have really progressive opinions on almost every social issue. But there are issues where I have my doubts or I might not be all the way down the line on the opinion. And you know what I do? I tend not to say them too loud. I tend to check and see if it's safe to come out with that question or that point of view. So that's not different from us. Imagine what it means for an evangelical to take a position that runs contrary both to their most important spiritual experience and to the relationships that give them security and meaning. And honor that all of us have experiences and relationships that we're not willing to put on the table right now. If you do that and you do it seriously, we might be able to get inside that, the circle of trust for someone who disagrees with us. It's the second thing. So thing three, our greatest challenge in these relationships is to be our own best selves. Um, that's hard. It's really hard. I don't know about you. I have an anger response to some of the things going on right now. It's hard for it not to show. Um, I also have a fear response, and sometimes that shows up as aggressiveness. But the most important thing I can do is to live according to my core values and be consistent in all those ways. When you think about being our best selves, Unitarian Universalists have seven principles. Evangelicals often turn to the passage earlier read from Paul's letters, we, we memorize this verse. I've memorized it in too many translations, so I can't say it. I have to look. Uh, but evangelicals memorize it. We call it the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, endurance, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-discipline. Um, if it were up to me, Paul could add a thing or two. He might add something like justice or courage, right? Um, but it, as Paul says in his letter, it's hard to go wrong when you're living out those kinds of values in relationship with other people. According to Paul, those are signs that this is what evangelicals believe, signs that the Holy Spirit is active in our lives. Now, I don't want to suggest that any of us are obligated to tolerate bad behavior or abuse. 
And we sometimes experience that from people who are sure they're right um, or who have deep anger or social resentment. Um, I don't think I need to go on. We can imagine what that looks like. It's no one's obligation to have someone shout, demean, dominate, claim. Um, no, no point in that. Um, it's fine to walk away. Find a walk away for a while. Find a walk away sometimes for a long while. But it never helps. If, if our goal is to help change, or maybe a better way to put it, if our goal is to create space for change, it never helps to be arrogant. Even snarky, I'm trying to work on. And I'm a professor. That's what we, that's like fuel for professors is snarky. Um, snarky is never helpful. Condescension, condescension doesn't work. So thing three is the primary thing all the time. To live in conformity with our own values, not because it's useful, uh, not because it's good for us, though I believe that's true but simply because it has integrity. And at the end of the day, I always wanna look back and say, at least I did it with integrity, whatever, whatever it is. So I give you thanks um, for the opportunity to share in this conversation and to worship with you and your congregation and look forward to talking with, with some of you, um, hopefully lots of you later. Um, May you live with health and happiness. May you be healthy. May you be guided by love. May you live at ease. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Our closing song this morning is a reprise of our opening song, People Get Ready. And this version is by the late, great Eva Cassidy. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. The world and our small place in it are indeed conflicted and broken. And sometimes the divisions between us seem too wide to bridge, yet there is hope. We have gifts and aspirations and values and principles that are worthy. When we continue to strive for the better world we all long for, it becomes more likely. Let us leave this service of worship encouraged to maintain that hope and to do what we can, when we can, with the people who share our lives and those who are different from us. Go today in strength, go in courage, go in anticipation of progress, and go in peace. Amen. Our worship has ended, but our commitment and our connection to one another endures.